On this edition of the Newsmakers Review of the Week, the battle for Mosul. We look at the challenges and dangers of the major operation to clear Daesh from Iraq's second city. Also on the program, a nation in mourning. We look back at the life of Thailand's King Pumipon and ask what his death means for the country's future. And a special report from Colombia. Why did Colombian people reject a deal with FARC rebels? And is peace still within reach? Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers Review of the Week with me, Andrea Sankey. The long-awaited operation to clear Daesh from their stronghold in Mosul began on October 7th with columns of tanks rolling across the dusty plains of northern Iraq. Initial progress was swift, but now there are signs of Daesh digging in for a long battle. And the real fight will only begin when the forces reach the city, the second biggest in Iraq and home to more than a million people. Francis Collings is in northern Iraq and sent this report. It's obviously an important part uh, of this broader effort to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. The offensive to retake Mosul is underway. Iraqi and Peshmerga forces are fighting together for the first time. They're closing in on Daesh with air support from the US-led coalition. Peshmerga started the offensive and have recaptured dozens of villages from Daesh. It's now up to the Iraqi forces to continue the drive west to the heart of Mosul. Our Peshmerga brothers have done well up until now. There's no difference between us and them. We'll continue to fight, side by side. Mosul holds symbolic and strategic importance to Daesh. After taking Iraq's second biggest city in a lightning advance in June 2014, it declared its so-called caliphate. But Daesh has been losing ground since June. Mosul is its last stronghold in Iraq. It's a key supply line into Syria. So far, the group has been avoiding direct combat, retreating and using booby traps, mortar shelling and suicide bombers to slow the advance. The coalition says its mission is ahead of schedule, but it will take weeks, if not months, to take full control of Mosul. As coalition ground troops move closer to Mosul, Residents in nearby villages continue to flee, seeking refuge in camps like Dabiga, half an hour's drive from the city of Erbil. The coalition forces have said they will ensure there are corridors for civilians to get out. This mother walked for hours with her children. We walked for eight hours. We escaped in the afternoon after paying smugglers $100 per person. We had to cross dangerous areas that they told us were full of booby traps. I was very scared. It was a very big risk. When we finally made it to the front line, we were met by Peshmerga forces and they drove us to this camp. But the camp is already overwhelmed. And as the battle to liberate Mosul continues, the number of refugees will continue to grow. The United Nations has warned as many as one million could flee once the fighting reaches the city. And among the looming humanitarian crisis, there could be another threat. The Dabiga camp has not been allowing everybody in. This is a screening area for people to go to the next refugee camp, being screened precisely to work out whether they've had any connection or had any membership of a group like Daesh. In the last few days, many have come through here from villages in and around Mosul and from Mosul itself when they've got out. And we've been told that up to 60 have been accused of being members of Daesh. They've now gone to courts in Erbil. US generals say senior Daesh leaders in Mosul are retreating. There's concern about where they will retreat to, whether they'll flee to Raqqa in Syria and regroup or hide among civilians trying to escape. Francis Collings, The Newsmakers in northern Iraq. 
I spoke to Saad al-Mutalibi, a member of Iraq's governing state of law coalition, and also to Ahmed al-Burai, a lecturer at Istanbul Aydin University, who believes there is a risk that the fight for Mosul could descend into a bloody sectarian battle. If you go back to the track record of the Iraqi uh, government and the way this happened before in Fallujah, this happened before in Ramadi, in other provinces that were held by other extremists like Al-Qaeda and even ISIS itself. So what happened later on, they promised that the popular uh, mobilization front or uh, units uh, known as Hashd al-Shabi are not going to participate in these operations. They, most of them are a Shia uh, from the Shia sects. Uh, that's why what happened later on, they participated and then the, the conflict uh, uh, deteriorated and there were massive uh, uh, killings and more enforced disappearances, more crimes against humanity happened in these cities. That's why the people of these cities are not going to support the so-called uh, liberation process unless they have genuine trust in the operation and they believe that these forces came not just to get rid of ISIS but in order to give them the alternative after in the aftermath. Saad al-Mutalibi, is your outlook any more optimistic? Uh, certainly, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, one can uh, look philosophically at events from a different view, uh, but uh, truth and facts have one face only. The, uh, first of all, the Shia uh, PMUs, the public mobilization units, the PMUs are not taking part in this battle. They are only to close the uh, uh, openings that may occur during the fighting and to surround the city from different directions in case there would be an exodus of uh, ISIS uh, fighters from Mosul towards Syria. Ahmed, do you believe that the Shia forces are actually not taking part in these battles because Saudi authorities have come out, for example, and vehemently said that they are involved and that there will be a disaster, a violent disaster, should Mosul be liberated, particularly because of these forces? That is the crux of the, the whole issue. What the other guest in, uh, uh, in uh, Baghdad said, exactly what will happen that these popular mobilization units are going to be in the, um, around the city and they're going to uh, capture everybody who is fleeing from the residents of the, the city itself. And that's the big concern. That's the worry of the city residents. They're going to flee. ISIS, but unfortunately at the end, what they're going to receive, they're going to receive these militias, these forces, they're going to punish them collectively, they're going to, uh, b because they will accuse them of being either complicit in a Daesh a crimes, mm -hmm. or they're being covering Daesh and they're being affiliates to Daesh, <coughs> and they cannot prove this. Okay, Saad al-Mutalibi, I can see you smiling in disagreement, actually. <laughs> yes, it's, um, it's uh, really funny the way some uh, uh, analysts have been moving towards insisting that the uh, PMUs will take part in this battle. The Saudis were warning, as the Turks warned, and uh, the, even inside Iraq, we are warning the, our friends and brothers, the PMUs, uh, to take a, an impartial position and only to uh, uh, make sure that the openings are closed. As for the population of Mosul, we have instructed them not to leave Mosul. None of the, until today is the second day of the battle, we have 120 targets inside Mosul, was destroyed today by aircraft, Iraqi and American aircraft. And uh, until today, not one member of the Mosul uh, society have left the city. Can I jump because in here? We've instructed them; they all should stay. They should stay in Mosul, go, and go none ahead, of them should Ahmed. leave. The, the point is the... to stay, to ask the people to stay in Mosul. That is a crime against humanity, because you know the massive power you're going to use in this, and you know that ISIS itself has captured the whole city, and it will not. 
uh, hesitate to turn the whole city to rubble. That's one th on the one hand. On the other hand, if the people flee, if they escape this fire, where are they going to leave? Did you give them safe uh, corridors to leave? No, you didn't. And this, what well, Amnesty, again, I, re I refer back to the Amnesty International report today and yesterday, they said that they're going to forcibly be, uh, disappear and they're going to be tortured if they're going to be. Um, and they have, like, testimonies and lots of eyewitnesses. This happened before. We don't, we're not speaking from a different word. We're speaking from track records of Fallujah, of Ramadi, of other provinces that have been okay. recaptured from these extremists. Assad, I'll give you a quick minute to respond. Yes, well, first of all, Amnesty International don't have a, an office here in Baghdad. They are speaking from uh, eyewitnesses, supposedly eyewitnesses, and from quarters that are definitely are associated in one way or another to either to ISIS or to the Ba'athists or to regional powers. So it's in with, within their interest for those individuals to tarnish the reputation of Iraq and the armed forces. All this, this gentleman, Mr. Ahmed, have, uh, uh, said now, uh, have no proof on the grounds whatsoever. All these are made up stories and I was in Fallujah, I was in Salah Din, I was in Ramadi, and I've seen with my own eyes the, uh, the positive treatment of the uh, civilians and the uh, legal treatment with the ISIS members who were turned on by the population. The population told us that this man is ISIS and this woman was doing so and so in the market and she's ISIS. The population themselves, they introduced ISIS to us. Also in Mosul, we have a total complete list of all the ISIS collaborators. Okay. So there is no individual, innocent individual will be accused falsely. Thailand is a country in mourning following the death of 88-year-old King Pumipon just over a week ago. Bars have been closed, celebrations canceled, and all across the country, people are wearing black. The outpouring of grief for a revered monarch was to be expected, but the king's death has also cast a shadow of uncertainty over the country. Natalie Pohonen reports. The grief over King Pumipon Adunyadet's death is still raw. Thailand will be in mourning for a year. Black and white has become the unofficial uniform to show respect for a beloved king. His loss is being felt across society. King Pumipon was both a stabilizing influence during political turmoil and a monarch who was worshipped by the people. He was the great unifier during 70 years of rule. And his death has left the nation not just in sorrow, but also in a state of uncertainty. The next in line to the throne is Crown Prince Maha Wachiralunkon. His decision to delay succession while he mourns has led to a caretaker monarch. Prem Tina Sulanom, the 96-year-old head of the Privy Council, has become regent. While King Pumipon was widely adored, his son has been a less popular figure. But any discussion of the royal family is tightly controlled. Thailand has some of the harshest Les Majesté laws in the world. Article 112 of the Criminal Code states that whoever defames, insults or threatens the king, the queen, the heir apparent or the regent shall be punished with imprisonment of 3 to 15 years. Images like these taken of the Crown Prince in Germany this year cannot be published in Thailand. And at the weekend in the country's south, this woman was accused of posting a disrespectful comment about the late king. She's now facing charges of insulting the monarchy. The king's support for the military during his rule has shaped the political landscape. There have been 10 successful coups since the end of World War II. The latest was in 2014. And public protests to restore democracy were ignored. 
The junta, led by general-turned-prime minister Prayut chan was given palace backing. In August, the prime minister promised elections next year. But the king's death and the uncertainty around the appointment of his official successor could mean democracy is placed on hold. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, Serhat Unaldi is an author on the Thai monarchy and a professor at Humboldt University in Berlin. He believes King Pumipon is leaving behind a divided country and says the strict laws against criticizing the monarchy mean that the picture emerging from Thailand is not entirely accurate. If you ask people in Thailand right now, you will only hear those, um, those positive voices, the, those positive assessments of his reign because there is this Les Majesty law that you mentioned um, earlier, um, which uh, uh, puts people in jail if you criticize the monarchy. Actually, what you've seen over the previous days is or that you already have mobs going after people who have uh, um, expressed signs of relief on social media like Facebook and Twitter uh, that Bumipol has passed away. And uh, uh, people are actually um, getting very angry at those people. The um, uh, broadcast uh, authority in Thailand, uh, uh, telecommunications authority, has already ordered people to keep their um, eyes open, uh, to watch out for people who show signs of relief um, over Bumipon's death. You see Thailand's democracy as something that's extremely flawed and that actually this king was not the unifying presence that he's actually made out to be. He was really more of a polarizing figure, in your opinion. Yes, that's um, exactly my uh, point of view. The image of the, king, uh, of the king has been shored up since the 1950s. That was actually a political decision that Thailand's military dictators at that time made together with the United States. They shored up the image of the king, of the monarchy, um, in order to create a royal ideology as a counterforce to um, communism that was rising, that was on the rise in Southeast Asia in the 1950s. I mean, uh, in the decades before Bumipon assumed the throne, um, the Thai monarchy was actually quite weak. And then there was this deliberate decision by the United States and uh, the military dictators at that time to use Bumipon as a political tool and to shore up his image, uh, to um, let him uh, uh, walk around the country as a sort of demigod, revive old traditions in order to shore up his image to, to um, create a charisma, a kind of charisma around him. And today that seems very natural that Thai people actually adore the king uh, the way that we are made to believe through the media in recent days. At the beginning of the month, the Colombian people narrowly rejected a peace deal with the leftist FARC rebels who've waged a decades-long and bloody war against the state. The deal had been the product of four years of difficult negotiations for which the Colombian president, Juan Manuel Santos, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. But has the recent referendum result dashed those hopes for peace? Or could it be a chance for a stronger, more durable deal to emerge? Sandra Gatman has our special report. A song for peace to seal a deal between the Colombian government and FARC rebels. This was Colombia's moment to end a 52-year war with the Marxist guerrilla group. But Colombians still had the final say. The government urged them to vote yes to end the war and begin reconciliation. But the opposition shouted no, wanting peace, but with retribution. All the polls predicted the deal would pass easily. But it didn't. 50.2% of voters rejected the agreement. Colombia's big cities, except the capital, Bogota, voted against the deal. 
whereas rural parts, hardest hit by the violence, overwhelmingly voted yes. But in the hills of Tolima, where the FARC's guerrilla movement was born, voters rejected the peace deal. We travel to the remote town of Villarica to find out why. Like much of Colombia's countryside, Villarica came under frequent attack at the height of the war. The scars from years of fighting with the FARC are still here to see. And for Natividad, memories of a midnight ambush 10 years ago are vivid as ever. Nosotros ya estábamos durmiendo. Cuando sentimos el alabaleo, a nosotros nos cogió la toma acá en la pieza, en la primera, y nos tocó correr aquí para allá, para la última. Y esto fue terrible. Aquí para abajo todo esto, lleno de gente. These days, business is slow. It's why Elias kept quiet about his opposition to the peace deal. Speaking out against the government, he told us, could lose him customers. Es doloroso para un pueblo como Villarrica eh, decir que que ya el señor presidente ya hizo la paz con ellos y que él esté tan seguro cuando en Villarrica lo hemos vivido a ojos, a mano y a sangre propia. One man who has lived it is Álvaro Uribe, the former president of Colombia, whose father was killed by the FARC. In the 1990s, he led a ruthless military campaign against the group, decimating their ranks from 20,000 to 7,000 fighters, with the help of his former defense minister, now President, Juan Manuel Santos. Uribe has since become the biggest opponent of this peace deal, demanding harsher punishment for top FARC commanders. Pregunto a la comunidad internacional si un país democrático habría dado elegibilidad e impunidad al delincuente que como en el caso de Park a este secuestrado que aparece en esta foto le pusieron un collar bomba en el cuello. It's a powerful message that chimes with many Colombians, even in the capital Bogotá, where the population voted yes. But for Andres, voting against the peace deal wasn't about politics. He's a music teacher who simply took the time to read it. I read the document. It was extremely long, 297 pages, I believe, if I'm not wrong. And it was extremely difficult for the ordinary people to understand, even educated people. When I understood what was this about, I said, we are not welfare states. People struggle just to have a half-decent life, and suddenly, out of the blue, they come up with pensions and seats in the Congress and a lot of money uh, that we, as tax contributors, have to pay to war criminals. This is beyond belief. The peace experts say that a pursuit of justice must come with reconciliation. But in Colombia, decades of war have fueled animosity and distrust. Milena knows the struggle. She moved to Bogotá after leaving the FARC eight years ago. Ingresé a las FARC a la edad de los 13 años. Después de un tiempo, yo decía, yo, yo no puedo seguir más dentro de esta guerra. No vamos para ningún lado. Yo tengo una familia que hace ocho años no veo, no sé si viven. Una vida donde no conocías nada más que un fusil y, 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 y el monte. Entonces, eh, y tener que salir a la sociedad, pues para mí nunca fue fácil. Pero también hay mucha gente que dice, no, yo que voy a compartir mi vida o mi entorno con una persona como usted, sabiendo todo lo que usted ha hecho. At this specially organized volleyball match against Rwanda, former FARC fighters and soldiers are playing for the same team. It's a scene the government is keen to promote, but easier for some than others. Diego is a retired soldier who lost his leg in a landmine accident caused by the FARC. Considero que va a ser difícil porque no todos están dispuestos a aceptarlo. O sea, el yo sentarme a jugar con ellos es como yo darme cuenta yo mismo que el odio que una vez sentí que fue mucho, cambiarlo a al perdón. Saber que sí podemos trabajar juntos. 
siempre y cuando ambas partes estemos dispuestos a hacerlo y que el bien sea común. ¿Usted tiene fe? <laughs> Whether people voted yes or no, everyone says they want peace. But Colombians find themselves at odds over so much. There's been quite a lot of debate on the streets of Bogota following this plebiscite. What's clear is that the country is divided, not only in terms of how they see the agreement, whether they think it's fair, but there are far greater political divides in the country as well. La gente estaba engañada con el chavismo. ¿Qué hizo el chavismo? Chávez se llenó de plata, se enriqueció y dejó a la gente muerta de hambre. Y eso nunca sirve. Behind the parliament gates, senators also debated late into the night. They were supposed to pass new tax laws to fund the peace deal. Instead, politicians are trying to work out what to do with the rejected agreement. Is it still the epicenter of our politics? Is what to do or what not to do with the FARC? Which is simply absurd, because they don't represent no more than two or three percent of the Colombian people. Everybody hates them, everybody rejects them, everybody rejects violence. We could get rid of them through this agreement, and we chose not to. It's now up to the opposition, namely Álvaro Uribe, to bring new demands to talks with the FARC in Havana. It's a race against time as guerrillas wait in limbo, neither at war nor at peace. And Colombians wait for their historic moment to truly arrive. Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers. You've been watching this edition of the Newsmakers Review of the Week with me, Andrea Sankey. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye.